Uh, my name is Kristen Moon. I'm the president of Alexandria Historical Society. Welcome to our first talk of uh, 2019. I've got to remember what year it is. Uh, today, we're going to welcome Dr. Zach Schrag, who's a professor uh, at George Mason University. He's in the history and American, it's art history, right? Yeah. It's technically the history and art history department, um, where he teaches both 20th century history and history of technology. At Mason, he also directs their master's program in history. He is the author of The Great Society Subway, A History of the Washington Mestro, which, if you're interested, is available in the bookstore downstairs for purchase. Uh, it was also first published in 2006 and was issued in paperback in 2014. His research on the Metro has also appeared in Washington History and the Journal of Urban History and has been widely cited in our press, including the Washington Post, City Paper, Washingtonian, Washington Business Journal, the Kojo Namdi Show, All Things Considered, and the New York Times. Schrag is also the author of Ethical Imperialism, Institutional Review Boards, and the Social Sciences, 1965 to 2009, and is now working on a third book on Philadelphia nativist riots in 1844. May I please welcome Dr. Schrag. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very honored to be here, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I think we should uh, probably start with a little song. Uh, March 27th is Metro's birthday. So happy birthday to Metro. <laughs> happy birthday to Metro. Um, uh, it's 43rd birthday. And here's the thing about birthdays in your 40s. Um, they can be a little rough. Uh, uh, you've achieved some of the things that your parents wished for you. Uh, maybe you've achieved some of your own goals. But as you reach middle age, you confront the realization that not all of your dreams are coming true. Uh, you may start feeling the effect of decades of use on systems that once seemed to function without much thought. And how well you handle the challenges of middle age probably depends a lot on your finances. So Metro is no exception. Um, and uh, we certainly saw this in the last few years. Uh, the year 2016, uh, which was Metro's 40th birthday, should have been a celebration um, and, you know, in some ways it was. Uh, Metro uh, then as now was growing. This is the projected uh, Dulles extension uh, that should be open in a few years. Um, so there's that. Um, but for the most part, the last few years have been a pretty terrible time. Um, this is, uh, we've got since the late 1990s, uh, a steady decline in reliability um, as uh, systems originally put in place in the 1970s started to fail. Uh, in 2009, two trains collided and killed an operator and eight passengers, injuring 80 people more. In 2010, ridership, which had been growing consistently for a quarter century, uh, began to decline. And uh, then uh, in 2015, we had a series of missteps that led to a track fire uh, filling trains with smoke and killing one passenger. Um, all of this was not even the worst. Uh, 2016 was really the terrible year in Metro's history so far, uh, so bad that WAMU put out a podcast, Metropocalypse. Um, in March of that year, 2016, just days before the 40th anniversary, an electrical fire again flooded the tunnels with smoke. Um, and although no one died this time, uh, it was a repeat of the malfunction that had killed the passenger the year before, leading Metro's then new general manager to suspend operations for a full day so that the cables throughout the system could be inspected, an unprecedented emergency closure of a system that people had come to rely on. In response, uh, the Transit Authority announced SafeTrack, a series of closures designed to allow remedial work on long neglected tracks. And then in July, even amid the safe track repair, you had a train derailing at the East Falls Church Station, shown here, and leading to these high, uh, headlines, uh, time to give up on Metro in the Washington Post, uh, and then the New York Times down there, uh, Metro uh, 40 and creaking stares at a midlife crisis. Um, since then, we've had fewer of these spectacular catastrophes, but a continued drop in average ridership. So um, more Washingtonians, especially federal employees, are working from home uh, one day a week. 
uh, which causes a drop in the commuter rides. And then for the non-commute rides, uh, lunchtime, evenings, weekends, uh, many more Washingtonians are turning to Uber and Lyft and similar services um, that are now up to um, hundreds of thousands of people per day in the region. Um, those lose a lot more money than Metro, but they may be able to outlast it in terms of finances. Uh, by the end of 2018, average weekday ridership was down 17% from its 2009 peak. Average weekend ridership was down 31%. So I want to get all this bad news out there to start and suggest how disorienting this is uh, to someone like me who grew up with Metro when it was new and shiny. Uh, this is the metro I remember from my youth, right? Uh, you go into these, one, these underground stations and it feels like, or it felt like, stepping into the future. Soaring vaults, soft lighting, that murmuring air conditioning, less like the industrial subways of New York and Boston, more like the gleaming space stations of a science fiction movie. Uh, we should remember, however, that Star Wars was set a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> And uh, Metro is also uh, the creation not of the future, but of the past. Uh, specifically, it emerged from the 1960s, a period when Americans dared to think big. Uh, thinking big has kind of gone out of fashion. Uh, you get a lot of books like this uh, from economists uh, who complain about rail transit and other big infrastructure projects uh, that they say these um, are part of a, a a uh, pattern of disproportionately, disappointingly expensive infrastructure. Um, that the, it always costs more than you think, it takes longer to build, and then you don't quite get as many people as you had hoped to serve. So I want to, there's a lot of truth in that, but I want to push back on that argument as well and suggest that by thinking big, local and federal officials built a transit system that really changed the history of the national capital region. So rather than dwell too much on the problems of the present, I want to dwell instead on the problems of the past. I want to explain why previous generations thought so highly of rail transit and saw in it the possible salvation of a city. So we need to go back to 1950. In 1950, we've got two new technologies uh, in place. Uh, one is the atomic bomb. Uh, that is making some planners think that we really need to decentralize uh, workplaces in Washington and other cities so they don't all get wiped out with one hit. Um, and the other is the automobile, uh, which is not a new technology in the 1950s, but is much more affordable uh, to many more American families than ever before. And uh, so given these two trends together, uh, planners start imagining a decentralized government and a decentralized city. Um, uh, so they were thinking about spreading employment around. Some of these you know, agencies like the CIA and um, others do end up in the suburbs as a result of this kind of thinking. And at the same time, uh, transit is really struggling. There's a, a terrible streetcar strike in 1955 that lasts weeks or months, and it leads Congress to mandate the eventual removal of streetcars in Washington, D.C. Uh, so this did not look like a good time for rail transit. Instead, uh, when the National Capital Planning Commission releases its results of a huge uh, survey in 1959, it calls for a spider web of highways throughout the region, 329 miles altogether. So there are three concentric loops here. Um, in the middle loop, this one, uh, you've got, or, sorry, the, the outer loop, uh, is now the Beltway that you all know and love. Um, so that one should, should look familiar. Uh, then within that, you've got a kind of parkway going through uh, the old rings of Civil War forts in DC and Arlington. And then in the center here, there, uh, we'll come back to that, uh, we've got what was called the inner loop. And I'll, I'll give you a zoom in, and I should probably remember that this has a laser pointer. Um, and then radiating out from that, you've got these radial highways in every direction. So really a spider web with lots and lots of highways. Um, some of them would carry buses in dedicated lanes, uh, not all of them, express buses, um, sorry, not dedicated lanes. And then, uh, almost as an afterthought, you've got in orange here a two-line, 33-mile 
rapid rail transit system. Um, so this is um, the 1959, let's call it the Eisenhower plan, where you're gonna have lots and lots of highways and a few uh, um, subways or rail transit just where the highways can't carry enough traffic. Um, now you'll see one of the highways, uh, this is what you know as I-270. I-270 was planned to go right down, all the way downtown. Uh, through Northwest Washington, through Cleveland Park. Right, so here you go, through Cle Chevy Chase, Maryland, Bethesda, Cleveland Park, right down to around DuPont Circle. You know who lives here? <laughs> you know what those houses are like, right? Uh, big houses with lawyers and congressional staff. Um, these people have some tools at their disposal, and in 1959, they form what was called the Committee to Oppose the Cross Park Freeway, a classic not-in-my-backyard organization. We just don't want this here. Later, it becomes a little more positive. It becomes the Northwest Committee for Transportation Planning, so a more positive name. We're for something, not against something, and that's more than cosmetic. They actually had something they were for, and that for was transit. Uh, they argued that instead of building highways everywhere, uh, the federal government should consider alternatives and allow cities more choice. Uh, the 1956 Highway Act basically said to states and cities, the federal government will pay 90% of interstate highways and nothing for transit. And so these folks in Cleveland Park said, that's crazy, uh, we should have more options. They couldn't reverse the 1956 Act. What they were able to do in 1960 was by some time, Congress passes the National Capital Transportation Act, just for the DC region, sets up a little agency, the National Capital Transportation Agency, as a temporary body to, to think about this a little more carefully and plan transportation in the region. No one was necessarily expecting great things of this agency. Had Richard Nixon won the presidency, I think we would have gotten most of these highways built and nothing like the metro we know today. As it happened, Mayor Daley squeezed out those votes in Chicago, living or dead, and this guy gets elected. And this is really important. This was like one of the first big flashes I had in, in doing my research is, oh, politics really matters, right? This is not just a matter for engineers and planners. Uh, this is a matter for uh, citizens and politicians. Kennedy, of course, believed in the federal government. Uh, in his inaugural address, he asks what you can do for your country. Um, and throughout his presidency, he makes all kinds of claims about the greatness of the public realm. Uh, you can think of Project Apollo, his pledge to land on the moon. Uh, you can think of his calls for federal architecture that could provide the visual testimony to the dignity, enterprise, vigor, and stability of the American government. Kennedy was also a Washingtonian. By the time he's elected president, he's lived most of his adult life in Georgetown. He knows people around town, and he takes these friends of his and their friends and puts them in charge of Washington. Washington has no elected home rule in 1961, but Kennedy can appoint people who live in the region to replace the national experts who had devised plans under Eisenhower. And for our story, the most important of these is uh, this fellow, sorry, that's Judge Justice Douglas there, a um, big skeptic of highways. Um, and that's uh, Darwin Stolzenbach of Bethesda, Maryland, an economist um, who completely upends the uh, rationale for transportation planning when he takes over as the head of that new National Capital Transportation Agency. So here's our inner loop. Um, a figure eight going through downtown. These are, you know, clover leaves here. And these are huge. Each one of these interchanges is going to take out several blocks of historic DC. Uh, you're going to have one through the redeveloped Southwest. This actually gets built. Uh, you're going to have another one that goes as DuPont Circle here, take out the Cosmos Club, right? Take out most of uh, all those nice houses by DuPont Circle. You're going to have another one blast through Capitol Hill. Um, yeah, people were just appalled by this. Stolzenbach was appalled. Um, and uh, this particularly became uh, controversial. Now, the one part that it was partly built, uh, this is that tunnel on, in front of, uh, that you've probably been through, the 395 tunnel by the Capitol, and then up here you have what was then the center leg, because it's a center, you got, you know, west, east, and center. And uh, this is what that area looked like in uh, the 1940s. Um, so you've got the uh, you know, pension building, now the building museum here. You have the reg regular shops and offices and churches and all the rest uh, east of that and, and west of New Jersey Avenue. 
And this is what it looks like uh, by 2005. So they just blasted through, uh, you know, half a block of city uh, texture, block after block after block after block, to build that center leg of 395. Um, and, uh, you know, so now you have this huge trench between Union Station and the rest of the city. And here we have it, you know, from the ground view when it opens, that's uh, the, Tom Aris, the engineer who sort of was in charge of the project. Um, so you can imagine if that entire figure eight inner loop had been built, this is what much of downtown Washington would have looked like, these open air trenches. And if you've been to almost any other city in the United States, you've probably seen this, right? You try to walk through downtown Atlanta, or um, if you try to, uh, you know, walk through Detroit, you know, it's very common to have your walk interrupted by some massive multi-lane freeway. Uh, you know, currently this is being finally decked over at the cost of like a billion and a half dollars to undo the thing that this guy was so proud of. Anyway, um, so Stolzenbach says this is not what we want for our national capital. And he proposes a reversing the logic of the 1959 plan. The 1959 plan said well, we're going to build as many highways as we can and use rail transit to make up the difference. And Stolzenbach's idea was let's build as much rail transit as we can and build only those highways that are still necessary. So he proposes not a 33 mile two line system, but an 89 mile rail transit system with lines in almost every direction. So much more, you know, three times roughly the scale of that 1959 proposal, much closer to what we have today. He still proposes a lot of highways. This is a lot more highways than eventually get built, but look, Cleveland Park has been spared, right? There's nice blank space there. And a lot of these have been downgraded to arterial roads, uh, not those big open freeways with the clover leaves. Um, and, you know, so he says uh, this, this can do most of what you need without tearing apart the city of Washington. We're going to have all these rapid transit lines. We're going to have some buses. That's, that's these. We're going to have some commuter rail coming into Union Station. Um, and together they can handle most of the traffic. And, and at the very last moment, someone said to him, hey, there's this little corner of DC that's not being served by any of this. And so he pulls out the tr transportation planner's favorite tool, the dotted line. We're going to see those again and again. Uh, dotted lines are really cheap. Um, you just put them down and everyone's happy. Um, this plan is tremendously controversial. It comes out in 1962 and the highway lobby, the gas companies, the car companies, the oil companies, the concrete companies, um, all get together and ask, why should you suffer? Uh, so this is an ad put together by the American Automobile Association, which was closely allied with all of those industries. Um, and the argument was, uh, obviously, we need highways here in DC. The underlying argument is a fear that if highways are scuttled in DC, other cities will also pick up. Um, there's a, already a, a freeway revolt going on in San Francisco, a smaller effort in Memphis. A lot of places are asking, do we re really want all these freeways? The highway lobby did not want to lose this fight. And initially they did not. Uh, they discredited Stolzenbach, he gets fired. Um, uh, his bill does not go through in 1963. And uh, the transit plan is scaled down um, to a much smaller, even smaller than that 33 miles, they take it down to a 30, uh, 25 mile so-called bobtail system, where they say we're just gonna serve downtown and everyone else is gonna drive and park their cars at the station, hence rapid transit for the motorist. We're gonna park it and, and then we'll just have this little thing almost entirely in, in DC, a little bit in Arlington, a little bit up in Silver Spring. Um, and the idea here is to get a transit system that the highway lobby won't fight, and it works. Uh, this passes Congress by a voice vote. There's Congressman Widener of North Carolina uh, shoving his colleagues uh, onto the train. Um, and, you know, he's promising them it's not going to cost very much. The whole system is going to cost $430 million, of which the federal government will charge $100 million. No problem. Um, now, uh, everyone kind of knew that this was the camel's nose under the tent. Almost as immediately as they approve uh, this plan, 
they said, this is actually a terrible transportation plan. You've got one, two, three, four, five different directions all feeding into one trunk line. If a train breaks down here, the entire system goes down. This is a really bad idea. So uh, they start with this plan as approved in 1965. Uh, this is, you know, a same map. Again, every, every single train would have to pass through these three stations. That's a terrible idea. They say to Congress, give us a little more money and we can have two trunk lines crossing. And uh, this now begins to look familiar, right? This is what you now know as the blue-orange line. This is now what you now know as the red line. They didn't get their colors until much later, but you're beginning to see something a little familiar. Uh, so this gets approved in 1967. Now, once this one gets through Congress, again, it's still almost entirely in D.C., going up to Silver Spring, going into Virginia, but it's big enough. It's been approved by Congress. A lot of people in Maryland and Virginia say, wait a second. Why is the federal government planning something that's going to affect a lot of people who live in Maryland and Virginia and commute into D.C., we want some control. And in 1967, not long after the passage of this, they persuade Congress to spin down this National Capital Transportation Agency, the federal agency, and instead turn things over to a new tri-state authority, the Washington Metropolitan Transit Authority, or WMATA, that at that time had no federal representation. It would be a DC, Maryland, Virginia body that would build and run the rapid transit. And this devolution from federal to local completely changes the logic of transportation planning. Because if you're trying to get something through Congress, you want it as small and cheap as possible. If you're trying to persuade people in a bunch of different counties to vote on bond referenda that are going to pass, then you want something as extensive. You want something for you and for you and for you and for you, something for everyone. And so uh, as Tom Dean, one of the planners involved in both phases said, it's easier to sell something that's a billion dollars than a hundred million because you can promise something to everyone. On the other hand, they're still expecting Congress at that point to pay two thirds of the cost. And they want to put some check. They can't have transit absolutely everywhere. Even with Congress paying two thirds, you don't want to bankrupt your local treasuries. So how do you do that? Uh, you need to have something of a compromise, uh, not the primarily suburban system that Eisenhower's experts had, nor that little urban system of the bobtail. You need something medium, metropolitan and that would serve both city and suburbs. Okay, so there's our bond referendum. Um, again, they have to get this plan through in 1968. Um, so um, uh, in the city, they, they stay with that part that had passed Congress. They'd already done a lot of the engineering work. Um, they, they weren't gonna mess with that. Uh, in the suburbs, they start with cheap rights of way. Where can we build uh, tracks on the surface? If you go from the surface to one of those elevated structures, I'm sorry, aerial structures, you're not supposed to say elevated because people think of Chicago, right? Aerial structures, uh, that's where you sell it. Um, you, you're doubling your cost. If you go underground, 10 times the cost of a surface line. So one of the things they look at, and this is where history is so valuable, is they say, hey, remember the 19th century when they built all these railroads everywhere? Those railroads are still there, or in some cases, the railroad right of way is still there. We can go on that. And again, some of this is, should look a little familiar. So that if you've taken the B&O to Bethesda, or the red line to Bethesda, you're going along the old B&O viaduct uh, up through DC. Uh, if you're uh, going out to Landover on the Orange Line, New Carrollton, you're on that old Pennsylvania right of way uh, that goes back to the 19th century. And of course here in Alexandria, we've got the uh, RF and P, the, uh, what is it, Rappahannock, Fredericksburg, and Potomac, is that right? And the, uh, Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac, thank you. Um, uh, and you know, down through Alexandria, obviously they divert it from National Airport, but a lot of what becomes uh, the blue line is you know, already mapped 100 years before people are even thinking of transit here. Um, and then where you don't have railroad lines, you build in highway median, which is the orange line out through Fairfax. Um, in other cases, they do say we're gonna put transit on uh, arterial roads or tunnels uh, in Arlington in particular. Um, another trick of transportation planning 
in a democracy is you want to give people choices, but finite choices, right? You're trying to get your kid, your two-year-old dressed in the morning, right? Do you want the blue shoot, shirt or the one with the clown, right? Not an infinite number of choices. And that's pretty much what the transportation planners did here. They came up with A, B, and C designs uh, for each jurisdiction. Um, and so you can see you know, the, the red and green and black. I, I hope you can see that. Uh, there's a big fight out in Montgomery County over how to get to Rockville. Uh, because they could do along that B&O, keep going along the old B&O tracks, or they can go up through Wisconsin Avenue, which is eventually done. Uh, and there were pros and cons of both. It was actually an interesting debate because both alternatives were pretty good. Um, and then, you know, you have uh, options out here. Um, you'll see uh, there's a discussion of a Columbia Pike subway um, that was studied, but obviously not implemented. Um, but some of the folks in uh, Arlington and Fairfax uh, really wanted that. So you have the staff saying, no, no, that's too expensive. You have the politicians trying to please their constituents. A, a, a lot of back and forth. Um, and then, uh, you know, in DC, again, that 1967 part is still intact. Like there's all three alternatives were going to keep that, but then there's discussion of a third line up through the center of the city. Where, should, where might that go? They also have to figure out how far out. You can see some of these lines go way, the, you know, way out past uh, the Beltway, out to, uh, you know, out to Centerville, um, you know, past Belvoir, um, really ambitious planning. But they begin to figure out no one's, or they don't expect anyone to ride transit that long. Uh, most people don't want to take uh, a commute longer than 45 minutes, so they, you know, a, People at this point are still working downtown. They figure if we cut it out roughly at the Beltway, two things will happen. Uh, first of all, no one's ride will be too long. And secondly, we can build these big parking lots to intercept traffic at the Beltway, and then people will ride the train the rest of the way. And, and you know, these parking lots, a lot of them get built um, uh, at, you know, Springfield and, and other sites, uh, Vienna and Fairfax. Um, so this works out, um, you know, pretty well. Um, by 1968, they come up with a map that has something for everyone. Um, and this, there's a lot of hybridity here. You can see that the stations downtown are very closely spaced together. That's because you've got high density. You want to have a station every half mile or so because people will use it. Once you get to the suburbs, you want speed. So there you get a mile or two even in between stations. It becomes more of a commuter rail service even as you've got the same trains on the same tracks. Um, in uh, Prince George's County, uh, you get four short lines. In Montgomery County, you get two long lines. So different shaped counties get different um, uh, kinds of service, but about the same mileage. Um, in uh, DC, obviously a lot of this is going to serve federal employment. A lot of the original stations are named after office buildings like the Pentagon and Federal Triangle. Uh, but you also get uh, service up to historically black neighborhoods, uh, U Street, Columbia Heights, um, in large part to serve, um, uh, well, in response to demands and, uh, from Howard University, uh, from Reverend Walter Fauntroy, from a newly emergent black constituency. They're still not enfranchised formally until 1974, but DC is on its way to home rule. Um, and then in Virginia, uh, you don't get the Columbia like Pike line, but you do get these two long lines. And uh, Virginia, I must say, and I, I'm a Virginia resident, Virginia is kind of cheap. Um, doesn't want to spend the money. So uh, most of, you know, Virginia has the largest percentage of lines on that surface, uh, in the highway median or in the rail, uh, so that they'll um, have less of a share to pay. Um, again, the one exception was uh, some folks really wanted the Columbia Pike line. You know what transportation planners are going to do. You pull out the favorite tool in the book, the dotted line. There it is. And dotted lines for everyone. We've got bonds to sell, dotted lines to Bowie, dotted lines to Laurel, dotted lines to George Mason University, what the heck, right? Um, so lots of dotted lines for future extensions. Um, and uh, some, of, you know, some of this, there are even like knockout panels in the stations in case anyone would ever want to uh, build one of those dotted lines. Um, this was going to be expensive. Estimated capital cost $1.8 billion in 1968 dollars. That's more than twice Stolzenbach's 1962 proposal. Uh, but it works. Uh, people in all the affected jurisdictions that had bond referenda voted for them. And Congress in 1969 agrees to fund two-thirds of the system. Uh, they're expecting 
uh, you know, you take that 1.8 billion, you add contingency, you add inflation, they're expecting $2.5 billion and the whole thing will be done by 1980. Hmm. Guess what? Um, over budget, behind schedule, right? Um, this has been going on since well before Metro, like the first suspension bridge in the world in England went over seven times its budget. Um, engineers have never, well, it's, it's a long-standing problem, nothing unique to rail transit um, or, to, or to Metro. Um, uh, my best estimate is that in 1968 dollars, the original Metro system cost about $3.8 billion to build, 50% uh, more than originally planned, and then with inflation, uh, that goes up to a lot more in nominal dollars. Uh, on top of that, the original plan was that at least some of that debt was, some of that cost was going to be paid down with all the surplus coming in from Fairbox revenues. Well, Metro has never run a surplus. Um, it has, you know, for a long time, uh, recovered about two thirds of its operating costs, which is actually quite good uh, for transportation systems in the developed world, um, but you don't pay bonds by getting close. Um, so those bonds had to be uh, forgiven with various federal subsidies. Um, so certainly, you know, this is where the mega project critics are right. Um, I, I think my biggest critique of them is why I critique mega projects. Has anyone ever built a bathroom that came in under budget and ahead of schedule? I don't think so. It's, it's projects that go over budget. But anyway, um, so Metro runs out of money in 1974, um, in part due to inflation, in part because of other issues, and uh, turns out there's a pot of money, uh, the urban freeways. So this freeway revolt has been going on um, uh, since uh, the 1950s, and uh, eventually in the 1970s, uh, the federal government and the DC government say, to heck with it, we're just not gonna build these freeways, we're gonna repurpose the money and build Metro instead. So one of the great things about Metro as a mega project is it killed what would have been a much more destructive mega project, that inner loop and the other freeways that would have torn up a lot of DC. Uh, so that's one thing about mega projects. Uh, a second virtue of Metro as a mega project is the regional consensus. Uh, there's the Georgetown University students getting beaten up in a, in a highway protest. Um, so, you know, this is the Metro map uh, as it appeared in 1976, and, and it actually, it's the opposite, where they don't have dotted lines. Uh, you know, you'd be forgiven to think that the entire system was complete. You have to look really closely and notice that, you know, this is a little black circle and that one's not. So um, they wanted people from the beginning to have that vision not of Metro as a little stub of a system which it actually was serving, but no, this is gonna be something for everyone. We're gonna have that regional consensus, and it worked. Um, as costs rose, as schedules slipped, uh, Maryland and Virginia stayed loyal. Um, they lobbied Congress to uh, help Metro out, um, and uh, they really realized that this would be as important for Maryland and Virginia as it would for DC. Uh, a really good comparison here is Atlanta, where uh, they, were, they built rail, but they also built all the freeways. So the suburban counties said, we don't need the rail. And they opted out of the transit authority originally, and Atlanta became as uh, car-oriented, I think, as any other city in the country. Uh, Maryland and Virginia really was quite different, where they um, remain passengers on Metro's crowded trains. And along with that regional geographic consensus, uh, there's a pretty good kind of demographic consensus where Metro is not only for people who can't drive cars uh, because they can't afford them or for other reasons. People take Metro by choice because they don't want the aggravation of traffic. Uh, it serves suburbanites, it serves DC residents, it serves black people, it serves white people, it serves adults and children, tourists and locals. Uh, this is a children's book, really kind of cute, showing, you know, the kinds of interactions, right? The teenagers kind of yawning, and you get the kids looking at each other, and the guy just kind of out of it with his Washington Post. Um, uh, this is really a, one of the places where the people of the region come together physically. So I think that, that regional consciousness has been really important. And then uh, third, and this is uh, really what, what brought me originally to the project, is the scale of Metro allowed a kind of transit-oriented development that most cities only dream about. So, uh, you know, here you have 11th Street downtown in 1967. Here you have 
uh, the same block. You can see this building is that building, so somewhat different perspective. But, uh, you know, downtown DC is covered with these office buildings built up to the height limit. Um, in that sense, Metro saved DC in, in terms of its finances. Uh, what you don't see in downtown DC, which you will see in downtown Atlanta, are whole blocks given over to structured parking. Uh, people get to these buildings by Metro, or they walk from their condos, or now the bike share or an Uber, but you don't have a lot of parking in downtown DC, which means that more land can be devoted um, to, uh, to buildings that actually produce revenue uh, for people and for governments. And, Part of the reason this works is what the economists called network effects. If you only had 10 stations on the system, not many people can get to this building. If you have 85 stations on the system going in every direction, then this land is a lot more valuable than every metro station is connected to every other one. And all of those building sites become particularly precious. Um, so the uh, dreams of the planners really did come into reality over the decades as metro was built out. And then what really surprised a lot of people is it happened in the suburbs. So here we have a 1962, you know, almost Buck Rogers vision of what the suburbs could be. So you've got a metro a rail line coming down here, and then at each station you'd have these futuristic skyscrapers popping up, and then the further you get from the station, they taper down a little bit in height, and then you get lower density, and then open space the further you get from the metro system. And, and you know, again, it, this could have been out of a science fiction comic book or something. You know, Superman's flying up there somewhere. Um, so that's the fantasy of 1962, and this is the reality of 2003, where the tall buildings pop up, and then you get the tapering out of lo lower buildings, and then you've got more open space the further you get from the line. So that's, that's Arlington. Uh, and since then you've got, all of this has been even taller, these buildings are now built up. Uh, it's still not done, we're still working on this project, um, but in Arlington and Montgomery County especially, uh, planners worked very hard to write the zoning rules and the tax incentives and everything else to channel the development. Um, and, uh, you know, today the Arlington County Board will say this is why we got Amazon, is because uh, you know, Crystal City is there on the metro line, um, and you know all of the. That, that was one of the criteria that Amazon was looking for. So um, the fact, this, I, 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 the scale of metro, I think, is what made this possible. Those Amazon folks can get anywhere in the region relatively quickly without a car, um, not just you know a few places. So it displaces freeways, it unifies the region, it creates transportation planning, um, all of which uh, I think uh, makes Metro a vital organ in the Washington region. Um, and until very recently, it could claim uh, the status of being the second busiest rail system in the country. Uh, with the decline in ridership, we're now third behind Chicago, um, which again is, is pretty sad for Metro's advocates. Um, so again, back in the good old days, like 2006, when the book came out, um, Metro was uh, getting about 750,000 riders on good days, uh, more than 200 million rides in fiscal year 2006. And again, I would argue that not only people who ride Metro benefit. If you have a spouse who drives to work, who rides to work, and you don't, um, you still may be able to uh, make one set of car payments instead of two. Um, or uh, if your neighbor is taking Metro, well, that's one fewer car on the road for you to compete with. Um, uh, certainly, if you live in a jurisdiction like Arlington with a lot of Metro-oriented development, your property taxes are a lot less. And, uh, you know, I think if you care about things like uh, shopping and museums and restaurants and theaters, professional baseball, all of this is made possible in Washington thanks to Metro. Um, uh, and, you know, big places like the Verizon Center and the ballpark, um, you know, they don't have anywhere near the amount of parking you would need in a less uh, rail-oriented city. Um, so for all of those successes, uh, Metro is something of a path not taken nationally. Um, in the 1970s, as Metro got expensive, the Ford administration in particular uh, moved away from that idea of regional planning instead of incremental planning. We'll build one line, see how it goes, maybe give you another one. Um, and pushing people away from what the Ford administration folks called the most expensive and most glamorous transit solutions. And that still pretty much remains federal policy today. Um, oh, there's uh, 
I don't know why I have this slide here. There's Tyson's Corner, which is getting its metro. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, right, so, so the Silver Line debates, I'll just talk a little bit about it. Um, this was the uh, federal policy. I don't claim to understand it, and it's now changed again. Um, but the basic idea was uh, a very skeptical approach. You really had to jump through a lot of hoops. Um, and uh, a lot of critics of the new federal policy argued that it was very short-sighted. It didn't think about things like community building and transit-oriented development. It was only about um, commuting and uh, those numbers. Um, and uh, so you've got this debate that goes on into the 21st century. Uh, this was uh, in 2007, the Federal Transit Administrator said, by thinking big again, we can develop the kind of national consensus that we get the kind of cities and nation that we want the resources to pay for them. Like that's exactly what you would expect from like the most gung-ho metro rail transit advocate. And right after he said that, he tried to kill the silver line. So um, I don't really know. There, there's a whole other book to be written. Eventually they, they get it back. Uh, 2009, uh, the US DOT pledges $900 million. And again, uh, it's, out, it's now been opened up to Wheelie Avenue. Um, there are my kids, yay, Silver Line. Um, uh, and uh, it'll get out to Dulles Airport eventually. Um, so a lot of twists and turns that we could tell about the Silver Line. Uh, I'll let some other person write that book. Um, Purple Line in Maryland, uh, obviously that's under construction now. Uh, you have streetcars built in DC. You have streetcars not built on Columbia Pike. Um, and now we've got bus rapid transit. So there's a lot more stories going on. Uh, what all of these things have in common though, however innovative they are, is none of them are regional. So the Silver Line uh, is really a Virginia project. Uh, most of the money is coming from the tolls on the Dulles Toll Road. Uh, a bunch of it is coming from the Commonwealth of Virginia. There's not DC money, there's not, for, not Maryland money, the way that there was with the original Metro with everyone paying into a pot. Uh, Maryland. Purple Line is a Maryland project. It is not a regional project. The DC streetcar is a DC project. Even some of these station extensions have been by the individual jurisdictions and not by the region. So we've really moved away from that regional vision that built Metro uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. That said, some of the questions that these new projects provoke should be pretty familiar. Um, what is the role of any kind of transit in a world where most American families can afford automobiles? Right? This, was a, this is a basic leap of faith that the Metro's creators built. This is not the New York subway built when no one had a car. This was, yes, we know people have cars and we're going to make a transit system so good that people will voluntarily take it. Did it work? Yes and no. Um, but surprisingly, yes. Um, what is the role of other technologies? So Metro is what you call a heavy rail system where you get on at a station and there's a lot of space between stops and you've got multiple cars. Now the purple line is a light rail system, same with the DC streetcar. Bus rapid transit barely existed. I mean, there were those plans for express buses, but they weren't, really weren't the same thing that you'll now get in a place like Crystal City. Um, so what is the, the ro uh, role of uh, other modes? Um, do you build your stations where people already are? Do you build your stations where you think people will be or where people should be? Are you trying to use this as a transportation tool to shape the region? Um, do you try to serve people who are transit dependent? Again, because they can't afford automobiles, because they're physically disabled uh, for whatever reason. Um, there are reasons for that. But again, if you only serve people are transit dependent, you're telling everyone else to drive with all kinds of congestion, air pollution, climate change, all of those bad effects. So maybe you want to make it uh, serve the people who take transit by choice. Um, how nice should transit be? Do you want it to serve people in dignity and comfort or the most utilitarian ad splattered thing that you can imagine? And who should pay for this? What level of federal, state, local, toll road, tax, fare support? Um, should uh, pay for the construction and operations. And none of these questions are new today. All of these questions confronted these transportation planners in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And they fought uh, battles, they took risks, they made decisions, uh, some of them poor, many of them good, about everything from station lighting to financing formulas to airport connections to voting rights. And they left us a legacy of rock tunnels, reinforced concrete, 
and debt, um, and also a city of peoples and buildings rather than cars and garages. So I think today's citizens and policymakers are heirs to that legacy. And maybe we need to think, oh, these are some of the transit projects that are, are being debated uh, now. Again, some of them metro, some of them not. Um, so here we have like the you know, cool science fiction uh, vision of metro in the early 70s where you'd have the supersonic planes flying over uh, the metro cars. Um, and right, and it's so, it, it's flashy. And this is sort of almost what it comes down to is um, Americans are not frugal people in their pub private spending, right? A lot of Americans buy not the cheapest car, not the most utilitarian car, but the car they want, um, even if it's gonna cost more to run um, and, and pay down that note. Um, they buy nice houses, they buy some nice furnishals, furnishings, right? They buy nice clothes. And sometimes they also do this in the public realm, taxing themselves to build parks and hospitals and universities and stadiums, um, not because it's gonna provide an immediate return on investment, but because they think the public realm should be as grand as the private. Uh, unsentimental economic analysis is really important. Uh, that should absolutely be part of a good planning program, but I don't think it can be the only part to determine whether a project is worth building. And in building Metro, Washingtonians did not want the cheapest transportation system. They wanted the transportation system best suited for the city they wanted for themselves and their children, and I think we can keep an eye on that decision today. And just to end up with the title of the book, uh, in 1964, when Lyndon Johnson gave his Great Society speech at the University of Michigan, he didn't metro mention rapid transit in particular, but he said some words that I think really express the values behind metro. Uh, that the Great Society, he said, is a place where the city of man serves not only the needs of the body and the demands of commerce, but the desire for beauty and the hunger for community. We live in a more cynical time when such words may sound too dreamy to serve as the basics for public policy, and certainly as Metro suffers from budget shortfalls and delayed maintenance, simply serving the needs of the body sounds pretty good. But I hope that all the problems that Metro is having will not blind us to the achievements of its builders. We're looking at a machine that brings together hundreds of thousands of Washingtonians, suburbanites, visitors from around the nation and the world, a machine that orders economic growth, that offers an alternative to traffic and pollution of automobile commuting, a machine whose de design, those stations, those cars can still delight so that we are looking at something more than a transit system. We are getting a glimpse at a previous generation's dreams of a great society. Thank you. I am Steve Kimball with the society and I'm sure Dr. Schrag would like to take some questions yeah. from the audience. Sir. Yeah, could you comment on why there's no metro stops in Georgetown? Sure. Um, so the story you may have heard is those rich white folks in Georgetown used their clout to kill a metro in Georgetown. And, and a little bit of that is true, uh, in that there were opponents in Georgetown who said, we don't want metro. Uh, when Stolzenbach was doing his planning in 1962, one of the routes they looked at was Georgetown. The planners looked at it and said, oh boy, uh, Georgetown is very close to a river. Uh, which means that we'd already be diving, the station would have to be deep. Georgetown is full of historic structures that we would have to carefully underpin to preserve them from vibration. Georgetown does not have a lot of employment, it does not have any tall buildings. This would be a terrible place for a station stop. And uh, it would also delay trains between Foggy Bottom, where they very much wanted a station, and Roslyn, which is a straight line now. So I talked to them, I did, about 60 interviews for this book, um, including a lot of people who were there you know, at the beginning in the early 1960s, and none of them said that citizen protest had any um, role in their decision. There were other reasons to kill the station. Now here's the, here's the thing. Every neighborhood, every residential neighborhood for which Metro was planned had some kind of citizen protest. There were citizen protests in Arlington. There were citizen protests in Bethesda. There were citizen protests in Forest Glen. There were citizen protests in DC. If you move to a place, you did that for a reason, either because it's really nice and you want to keep it that way, or because it's not so nice and your rent is cheap and you're going to get displaced if it becomes ever, any nicer. In Columbia Heights, I mean, this is, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's rich white people who protest transit. In Columbia Heights, working class African Americans sang, we will stop Metro to the tune of we shall overcome. 
in the uh, Oakland, there was a station planned east of uh, what was then RFK Stadium, or not then RFK, it is now, uh, uh, for the Oklahoma Avenue station. The um, African American community protested that and they got that station killed. That was the only station taken off the map because of community protest and it was working class African Americans who did it, not rich white people from Georgetown. So I hope I've messed with your mind at least a little bit. <laughs> yeah. What do, you, what do you make of the uh, obsession with um, having a full fare box recovery for Metro rather than looking for revenues? Because you know, highway tax funds don't cover small yeah. to get you to your door. Uber lost $1.2 billion last year. Right, so this, this was a huge debate in, in the 50s and 60s where um, the, the, you know, the interstate highway plan uh, was originally proposed earlier and, and the big debate was how to fund it. Um, and the promise of the 1956 Highway Act was that the gas tax would pay for it. So even though uh, car drivers would not be directly paying in terms of tolls the way they had for the New Jersey Turnpike and New York Thruway and, and previous superhighways, uh, the idea was that they would pay for the system. Uh, this has always been a fraud. Um, the, the numbers were never that much and not everyone who buys gas is driving on the highways. A lot of people buy gas to drive on local streets. Um, so you're right that the sort of fair promise of fare box recovery is best understood as one scam among many. Um, and, and this makes it really hard to be an honest planner in any kind of policy realm where you're competing with someone else uh, whether it's another agency saying we're going to build these roads that pay for themselves or yes Uber and Lyft that are doing these IPOs even though you know the Lyft one uh, the disclosure says we have never made any money we have no idea if we'll make any money we lose money on every ride um, but we hope to stay solvent enough that we'll put the transit systems out of business and then we can triple our fares I mean, that's they're not saying that part but I think that's what they mean um, so right, so a big part of the cost overruns with Metro is the planners trying to be as optimistic as the highway planners they were competing against. And all of those highways went over budget just as much as Metro did. The space shuttle went, I mean, the space shuttle was supposed to pay for itself. <laughs> in commercial launches, seriously, they were gonna like launch one every month and you'd put your satellite in and you know, they just like wipe off the grease and, and launch it again, right? Um, no, it's very hard to do any kind of sound thing when, when you're just surrounded um, by optimistic projections. So um, you're entirely right that, that this is just sort of one problem among many. There's a question here and I'll just go, I'll go with this way. Yeah. Uh, I could tell you're not a Marylander when you said Bowie instead of Bowie. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> seriously, uh, uh, thanks very much. Great uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to read the book. Uh, and I want to recommend another book uh, in addition to yours, which is uh, by a gentleman named Jeff Speck, who's an architect yeah. and, and planner. It's called Walkable City. And it, it really goes into great depth uh, into all, all the details of what makes a, a good city, yeah. uh, you know, transit and biking and so on. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. So Jeff Speck is among the new, new urbanists. Um, and, uh, you know, you can think of the intellectual history of Metro as, as going back, you know, so in, in the 1960s, the, you know, key figure was Jane Jacobs um, critiquing, uh, you know, one of her early fights was against Robert Moses' plans to drive a freeway through uh, Washington Square Park, which made it onto Mrs. Maisel recently, right? Um, great to see. And, and in, in many ways, um, uh, you know, some of the people who were supporting Metro, uh, especially on the citizen side, those, those anti-freeway protesters were, uh, you know, reading their Jane Jacobs and getting very inspired. And so now we have kind of a generation's of new Jane Jacobses or people competing who all want to be the new Jane Jacobs. Um, and uh, the blog Greater Greater Washington is, you know, very much in that ethos. Um, you know, one thing um, that gets a little complicated is some of those folks uh, are against big things altogether. Uh, and this was uh, Lewis Mumford's critique of, of Jane Jacobs. Um, Lewis Mumford was a, a very early critic of the highways. Um, uh, and so, you know, one of the interesting things is it's not just a yes or no, it's, it's the, 
it's highway versus transit, but also big versus small. And so Jane Jacobs, you know, some of those folks are very much on that incremental versus mega project side, and, and they certainly have some points. So yeah, they're, they're these, um, you know, it's, it's more than half a century now since uh, the death and life of great American cities. That was 1962, I think, just when this was, was happening. Um, and so a fascinating, you know, set of, of intellectual debates going on. Yeah. Um, in light of the declining ridership that's going on, with them closing down the blue and yellow line from National Airport yeah. South, which affects me and yeah. I'm sure many other people, is there a concern that people aren't going to come back? To oh place? yes, oh yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, the WMATA is terrified that you know once once a rider finds another way to do it, then they may say, oh. I can bike, uh, you know, or oh, I can carpool um, and and not come back. Um, so you know, certainly the transit planners, uh, you know, hate to close down a line. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the photographs of those platforms that are collapsing. Um, and so you know, the um, the you you can understand it from the safety engineer's point of view, where we've got to get this right. Um, you know, I mean, it's the same thing with aviation, right? I mean, so uh, Boeing didn't want to lose its market share. They were competing with Airbus. They pushed the 737 MAX into production. Now they've killed hundreds of people. And, um, and you know, who knows about the future of that company? So um, there's always this tension between, uh, you know, holding on to your customer base and saying, wait a second, we've got to get it just right um, to save people's lives. And so they're in a very tough spot um, at the Transit Authority. I don't know that there's, you know, any good answer there. Is, was yeah. there they didn't have to completely shut down? Uh, so again, the, the part of the reason, so, you know, one of the things that happened is there, there's, um, you know, the original plan was basically to run the trains um, 5 a.m. to midnight on, on weekdays and, and less on weekends and try to do all the maintenance needed in those windows. Um, part of the problem is that was really hard. Uh, part of the problem was the demands for late night service, um, where you've got that tension between don't you want to keep Metro running later on, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, so people will, you know, go to the bars and not drive drunk and all that. Um, but that cuts into the maintenance slots. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, all of the, you know, from 2000, well, really the collapses begin in, in the late 90s, but certainly with the 2009 crash, is more and more people saying, you know what, let's just shut it down, scrape it down, scrape out every rotten cable, every rotten, you know, cross tie, um, and, and do it uh, from scratch. And this debate is going on right now in New York City, I think with the L line, where the original plans were to shut it down for years, and then, uh, you know, just recently, I don't even know where the, that stands. There's this last minute proposal, wait, we can just sort of staple on some new electricity. Um, and the engineers are saying, no, that's what got us into this mess. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really hard um, when uh, you, you've got to close down the lines. But Chicago um, closed down one of their lines, I can't remember the name of it, uh, for half a year. Uh, you know, the same calculation. I don't know if the uh, patronage has rebounded on that, but Washington is hardly unique in saying, no, we've just got to close it down for several months and really do it right. And you can imagine how much easier it is if you can just leave your equipment there as opposed to, you know, pulling it out every night and, and trying to put it back in. Um, it's so much easier for the maintenance folks if they can, if they can just have their tools there. Uh, here and all of good, yeah. Can you comment on the general debate over dedicated freeway lanes versus rail networks and how that played out? And more specifically, and this legs into your question, the, the history of the Shirley Highway, yeah. how those express lanes came to be, and what some good resources are on that front to dig in. Yeah, it's interesting because yeah, Shirley Highway, um, you know, which is now 395. I don't know if people use the term Shirley Highway as much. It was very popular in the 70s. Um, uh, was a pioneering, you know, bus lane uh, experiment. And, and the problem is, you know, so bus rapid transit can do amazing stuff. People uh, look at Curitiba in Brazil in particular. Um, you know, Pittsburgh has had bus lanes on their ravines for years. Uh, you know, the problem is it's just, uh, there's always the temptation to say, well, let's let the carpools in. Let's let the people who pay tolls in. Oh, that guy is cheating. Well, whatever. And, and very soon, uh, the bus lane becomes just another car lane. And, and you know, we've had this debate um, with I-66 
where you know the the there's this huge freeway fight in Arlington. Uh, part of the settlement in the 1970s is it will only be for carpools within the Beltway. And then, you know, a couple years ago, they open up a third lane and they say we're, we're going to have carpools or tolls, but it's going to be demand driven. And now the tolls are $20, $30, $40. And people are really angry. And you think, well, but you never could use it before. And the answer is all those people were cheating. Like 60, you know, there's no way that the, 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 those, the, those numbers don't make any sense unless 66 was full of single occupant vehicles who are now for the first time being charged. And this goes back to the finance point, right? That you want to know how much a trip on an expressway is worth. You go to East Falls Church Station where they're showing the prices. It's like, oh, 20 bucks each way, right? That's like the true cost of all of these freeways. And it's been hidden, and that messes up everything. The cheap gas messes up everything, right? You cannot do any kind of like rational transportation policy as long as you have all of these hidden sub subsidies. But anyway, I think one of the problems with bus lanes, and this is in, you know, not only on freeways, but like in downtown DC, is it's very hard to keep the cars off of them. Um, either because they're just cheating or because they're writing to their representative saying, let me drive on that lane. Uh, here and here. One of the reasons they're having problems with repairing stations and therefore closing down the six of them, isn't it because they were very parsimonious on putting in switches? A somewhat parsimonious. I'm not enough of an engineer, um, but yeah, so. Uh, you know, sometimes I get asked about like a third rail. No, no transit system in the country has a full scale extra rail just for maintenance. Like you just, that's like having six wheels on your cars. You just don't do that. But you do have a spare in your trunk, right? Um, and there are these pocket tracks so that when, if one rail is uh, closed down, you can do single tracking. And uh, yeah, there it's a trade off. How much? And um, you know, in retrospect, that we probably could have done with more pocket tracks. Where that money would co have come from, you know, even in retrospect, is hard to say because uh, you know, every penny counted in building the system, especially in the 1970s, um, where you know, basically the financial model collapsed. So um, you know, even in retrospect, would we have built some stations to lower standards? Um, up on the Glenmont route of the Red Line, you've got what are those called shotgun stations, where they don't actually have the vault. You know, that's some of the economizing they ended up doing. So yeah, maybe they could have done a few more of those kind of smaller, not so nice stations and more pocket tracks. Uh, in hindsight, that might have been a good idea. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I take the, uh, the bus up the 395 express lanes every day to ride Metro, and they're not running them enough, and they run them less in the evening than in the morning, which is yeah. rather, rather frustrating. And if I lived four blocks farther away, I wouldn't really do it, because I'd only be able to take one tr bus to, to the, sorry, to the Metro. But, uh, the question I was going to ask is, New York subway 40 years ago was really, really bad. Yeah. Worse than we can even imagine. And it was able to rebound. So, I mean, what lessons can be taken from that? Yeah. The well, current now, right. Now the question is, was it able to rebound or did it just get some nice paint that held up for, uh, you know, because uh, New York, yeah, well, uh, some of it. I mean, the thing is, like, some of the stuff that is rotting out, um, you know, some of it was, Superstorm Sandy damage, but some of it is stuff from the 1930s. They've got 1930s relays, uh, you know, still operating um, that they have no spare parts for, and it's, it's all duct taped together. Um, uh, you know, one of the things about Washington's transit finance issues is it's hardly unique. Uh, Boston, you know, would probably take multi billion dollars to uh, get in good order. Um, New York did absorb billions of dollars, will take billions of dollars more. They don't have anything like uh, the uh, access for wheelchairs and strollers. I mean, there was that death recently in New York City you may have read about that, that really galvanized attention of a woman who, who went down the stairs. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, it is sort of this exercise in misery and like which uh, transit system is, is suffering the worst. Um, uh, you know, and then you look abroad and you say, well, Toronto has always been relatively well funded and they've never had these crises. I mean, it's like the Canadian banking system. It turns out if you do things like slow and steady, uh, your stuff holds up a lot better. Um, so yeah, uh, New York, you know, all of New York City went bankrupt 
uh, in the 1970s, essentially, and it, it took a, a big infusion of uh, federal and, and state cash. Um, so one of the big debates about Metro is how much of it is just not enough money and how much of it is other things like um, you know, management strategies, um, the, you know, the problem of a more expensive labor force uh, with medical costs and pensions. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I'll can tell you, in the education sector, uh, you know, this is as much a, an issue as everything else, is any, any labor intensive sector um, is, is going to suffer when, um, uh, you know, the cost disease is what they call it. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's a problem of money, but it's not just a problem of money. And I don't know how we get out of that. Uh, okay, I'll go here and, yeah. Hi, um, I was curious, we were talking about Uber earlier, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. I know Metro has been, you know, that had some board members saying we should be less partnering with Uber and Lyft, you yeah. know, shifting more, relying on them to be more of a commuter system than a full, you know, 24, right. you know, all week system. And now they're looking to subsidize late night pay, yeah. so like three dollars per ride for people who are leaving work late or going to work late. Uh, I was just wondering, like, what your thoughts are. You know, do you think that local leaders are prepared to? withstand the onslaught of Uber and Lyft because they are burdened cash. And yeah. As you mentioned, they can't sustain that. So is it going to be a to see who can last the longest? Like you kind of hit that. Right. The, the, what's the phrase? Uh, the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. Um, that is uh, a big part of what Metro is facing right now. Um, so I mean, part, there, let me give some historical perspective. You know, one is uh, that um, the planners of Metro always expected it to be primarily but not exclusively a commuter service. So, you know, when they're designing all those lines down into Washington, when they're thinking maybe, well, you know, one of the reasons that Metro opened the red line first was to serve Union Station because they were expecting people to take in, you know, what are now Mark and VREA, they had different names then, but people to come into Union Station and then they need some way to get around downtown and Metro would do that. Um, so it's always been mostly commuter service, but you know, even in the 1970s, they were getting a nice you know, extra chunk of revenue from people going to lunch uh, or going shopping in the middle of the day. And if you've you know, got this huge capital cost, all that is marginal um, you know, profit or, or you know, revenue. Uh, you're, not, you're running the trains anyway. It's really nice to have that bump. Um, same thing with the, the weekend service. Um, the late night service, again, was less a part of the original mission, and uh, Metro is, has never been good at that. Metro, you know, heavy rail system is good when you've got a lot of people going in the same direction at the same time. So really good for morning commutes, really good for sports games, you know, you see the Capitals get out, and, you know, I was on Metro the night they won the Stanley Cup, and oh my god. Um, uh, uh, so, um, it, you know, the late, you know, Paying someone else to do your late night service so you can do your maintenance, that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, the weekend and lunchtime stuff is scarier because they do want to run trains then. And if these irrational actors are going to you know, lose extra money uh, driving people, that's a, that's a real problem for the transit system. The other thing I want to say briefly, and this goes back to that rail rapid transit for the motorist map, is that Metro has always been designed to be multimodal. You take commuter rail, and then get on Metro, or you, you know, your spouse drives you to the station and then you get on Metro. Surprisingly little attention to bicycles um, during the initial planning, even though there was a kind of mini bike boom in the 1970s, it's just not something I found. Um, now that's being, you know, worked into the stations more East Falls Church, they're building this whole new bike station, they've got one at Union Station as well, and of course bike share is around a lot of the Metro stations. So, um, you know, some multimodality is healthy, too much multimodality, and you've got a problem if you're a transportation planner. Uh, sir. Yeah, yeah when uh, Metro got built out, Arlington stations created the Wilson Boulevard corridor, which is quite vibrant. Yeah. Uh, and Fairfax County has parking garages. Yes. And now they're extending it and they're getting more parking garages. I mean, what's the difference? Yeah. Between those two jurisdictions. One is a car center and the other one's. Right, and this goes back, uh, you know, I cover, I 
do compare those two counties um, in the book. Um, there's been some stuff written. Uh, Arlington Magazine did a nice piece a few years after that. Um, you know, the Arlington had people paying attention really early on um, in 1960, 1962. Stolzenbach was out there in all the counties, but not all of them wanted to listen to him, and Arlington really did. And the initial proposal was, we'll put it in the median of 66 all the way out from Roslyn. And Arlington said, no, we've got this plan. We're going to redo this, uh, this corridor along uh, Wilson Boulevard. And Stolzenbach said, OK, well, if you've got a plan, we'll work with you. And so Arlington was pushing that. Fairfax was barely paying attention. I went through the minutes, like, you've got these part-time board members. A lot of, there were, there were these crazy elections in Fairfax over sewer permits, um, really a debate about what kind of growth would be in the county, very similar to sort of what's going on in Loudoun now, uh, really, and, and they just were not paying attention. They just said, just give us what's cheapest. And again, what's cheapest is the highway median. And that's sort of what happened um, as well. Now with Tyson's, they do have more hopes, but it's very, you know, it would have been so much better if they'd got, reached Tyson's in 1980 or even in 1990. Uh, you know, rather than, uh, you know, 2014 or whatever. But, that it just, um, once it's built out with all of those multi-lane highways, with all of those turn lanes, with all of those garages, you're going to have to, I mean, even in Arlington, even in that Roslyn Boston corridor, which again is like, you know, Speck and everyone else, like that's the national model. Um, you go down there today and there are still cranes up because they're still building it out. I mean, those stations opened up 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And... Um, they're, it's, they're not done. So Tyson's come back in 40 years, maybe it'll start to look good. <laughs> yeah? Maybe it was in your book, or maybe I heard it someplace else, but apparently this man up here on the wall yeah. was instrumental in making, in urging the planners to not have the low ceiling stations, but rather to go to the arches? Is that well, uh, the way Washington works, you know, is that, uh, you need the authorization for the president, so you write something, you put it on his desk, he signs, you get it back. Um, so it wasn't really, you know, there is a letter from Lyndon Johnson saying, build the best iron stations you possibly can, don't worry about the money, um, but he didn't write it. Uh, the, I think, you know, in my book, really the key figure in getting that rolling in the administration was actually in the Kennedy administration, and that's Pat Moynihan, um, who uh, was very, uh, you know, he was very, he was in labor, but very, cared a lot about Washington. You know, later in his life, worked on the Pennsylvania Avenue redevelopment, lived in uh, whatever that thing at Archives is. Uh, what do they call that development? But he had that penthouse there. Um, and uh, he was the one who really pushed through the guiding principles for federal architecture that empowered um, a lot of architects um, and planners in the Kennedy, and then Johnson kept a bunch of those people. So uh, if you're looking for the bureaucrat who really made Metro architecturally significant, I would point to Moynihan. Uh, maybe one more? Yeah. I'm just curious about your favorite anecdote from all your research on Metro. Obviously, there's some good ones in the book. Yeah, um, probably the, the naming of the stations. Um, so, uh, you know, there's been all this controversy recently about these station names that are just way too long. Uh, they don't look good on the signs and they're hard to remember. You know, I can never remember if Dunloring, Merrifield is one station or two, and I'm, you know, on that line all the time. Um, but, you know, back in the day, they wanted crisp, clean station names, and the, 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 the original station where the two major lines, the red and the orange, were going to cross was going to be called 13th and G. And one of the planners, William Herman, thought that's a terrible name for the most important station in the system. We've got to come up with something better. So he goes to General Jackson Graham, the general manager, uh, retired from the Army Corps of Engineers, and he says, uh, General, we can't have that name. We need something better. And Graham said, great, you, you rename the station. And, and Bill, go ahead. And, and Bill says, great, I'll get back to you. And Graham says, nope, nope, right now. And Herman says, uh, Metro Center? Great, it's done. Um, and, <laughs> and that's the way, you know, that's the Corps of Engineers way. I mean, this is a guy who was like, you know, at the Battle of Remagen, you know, we just get it done. Um, uh, so that's why we have Metro Station. It was a snap decision. I mean, that term had been used before, but applying it to the main transfer station was, was done in 10 seconds. Yeah, so there you go. Well, thank you. Thank you.
that was, that was great. We all look forward to your daughter coming back and explaining how those little electric scooters. <laughs> well, let me remind you that we, uh, our next lecture, May 22, is Dr. Cinder, Cindy Kerner from Professor George Mason. She'll be addressing three centuries of Virginia women's history in, quote, we cannot be tame spectators. And I hope you'll all be here to be untamed spectators. Yeah. Thank you. And again, Dr. Okay. Schrag's book is available. Yes, and I'll be happy and to I'm sign sure copies. I'm sure he'd like yeah. to sign them.